Thanks for joining me, it's Peter Barlas here, cardiologist. What I thought I'd do today is give you a brief overview of a very common condition that I get to see, but also seen by general practitioners, and that is high blood pressure. So what's it all about? What does it mean? And what can we do about it? Now, blood pressure is monitored by a tool that we have called a sigmomanometer, and this is the one that I typically use, uh, which is a manual one. Essentially, it involves a cuff that is placed around the arm. So you may have had that done by your doctor, and that cuff then is inflated, and we have a series of numbers here in millimetres of mercury, being the unit of pressure that we measure. So we inflate, and we then have a listen, and again, we have a listen here with a stethoscope to listen to the heart sounds as the blood is momentarily occluded in the artery. Then once we start hearing the sound, we start getting a sense of you know, both the systolic and then the diastolic blood pressure, and I'll outline what they, what they refer to. But devices have become very sophisticated now, and these electronic ones are equally good. Uh, you, don't need to, you, know, you don't need to have a stethoscope for these. You pop it around your arm, press a button, and most often these days, these can be linked up with your smartphone or device to share the information by Bluetooth, and then you can keep close tabs on it, in a tabulated format and a graph to see how your blood pressure trends are going. Now, when we do get a measurement of blood pressure, we get a high reading and a low reading. So you may have heard of the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. So here we have a blood pressure, say 120 on 80. Well, what that means, the higher reading that we're measuring here in the arm is essentially showing us the pressure that the heart is expelling blood out of the heart muscle. And obviously the artery supply goes down into our arm, and that's essentially what we are occluding when we're inflating the cuff, the artery, uh, that goes down our arm, and we can measure that. The systolic pressure is the pressure, in fact, and the reading of the pressure whereby the heart is expelling the blood out of the heart once it's contracted. The lower reading, or the diastolic blood pressure, is the reading of blood pressure that remains in the heart in the relaxed state, when the heart's relaxing, to allow more blood to come in before it contracts, before it undergoes a process called systole or contraction. That's the systolic blood pressure, then it relaxes and you get diastole or the low reading. So normally you might have say 120 millimeters of mercury, which is a normal blood pressure. And then when the heart's in a relaxed state, waiting for the next heartbeat, 80 millimeters of mercury, which is the diastolic blood pressure. So we get an assessment of those two readings and they are both equally important in deciding whether blood pressure needs to be addressed or not. There are certain conditions that can make your diastolic blood pressure high or low, and vice versa, your systolic blood pressure may be high compared to your diastolic. Crucially important is to actually monitor the blood pressure over several readings. Blood pressure will vary for many, many reasons. Okay? During the day, our blood pressure will fluctuate, will go up, will go down, depending on the way we feel, what we're doing, physical stress, emotional stress, will also contribute to, uh, to a high blood pressure. So we can't base a blood pressure reading purely on one measurement. We have an assessment over the course of several weeks uh, to get an idea of whether this warrants treatment or not. There is an entity known as a white coat hypertension. Now, I'm not wearing a white coat, as you can see, but traditionally, many, many years ago, when doctors used to wear white coats and used to visit the doctor, you can imagine that that is a stressful period where you go and uh, talk to a, a doctor about you know, your health concerns. We would often find that blood pressure may be elevated in that situation, in that environment. So again, it's not something that we can rely on to say that, yes, definitely we have diagnosed high blood pressure and then you need, you need to be treated. There are, as it, optimal ways to assess blood pressure, namely monitoring it at home over the course of a few weeks and keeping tabs on it. But there is also a, a test called a 24-hour blood pressure monitor. And that is a cuff that goes on around the arm 
again uh, with a wireless sensor that can perform the blood pressure readings every hour on the hour day and night and gives us a more comprehensive assessment in cases whereby there might be some doubt as to whether the blood pressure is in fact truly elevated or not and whether it meets criteria to have treatment. Well, typically high blood pressure does not cause any symptoms and that's really why it continues to be a major challenge. There are some people that might, in a period of high blood pressure, feel some headache, some vague dis discomfort around the head. Others might experience palpitations or flutters. But generally, it's often picked up incidentally. When you go in for something else and you see your doctor and they happen to do your blood pressure and it is elevated. We can't, however, rely on just the one reading of high blood pressure. We need to look at your blood pressure overall over the period of say weeks to make a judgment call as to whether your blood pressure is in fact raised and warrants treatment or not. There might be a genetic predisposition or a family history. Mum or dad may have had high blood pressure and it's something that you've been aware of. But there are also secondary conditions that can actually lead to a high blood pressure. And they can include various hormone abnormalities, issues affecting the kidneys. And these conditions can make you more likely to build up or to have a high blood pressure. it's important that you do have an assessment with your general practitioner or your local physician to see exactly how your blood pressure is. Most often things are going to be stable but again if we're finding that your blood pressure is consistently elevated over weeks then there is definitely data and evidence to say that lowering that lowers the risk for you long term. So one of the common reasons as to why I might get asked to be involved is when a blood pressure is not settling down or not responding to initial first line therapies. And when I say first line, there are various things that we need to be considering when we're looking at lowering blood pressure. And that includes lifestyle parameters. We know that, for example, there are lifestyle and dietary modif modifications that can be made to help reduce the burden of blood pressure, whether it be lowering salt intake, uh, other lifestyle factors such as smoking and addressing that critically important here because all of these and addressing these lifestyle changes means that we are less reliant on therapies such as tablets and medications so I think it's important again that we get on top of the diet the lifestyle and we know even weight loss will have a dramatic impact on blood pressure so you know, I suggest to my patients, even a kilogram or so of weight loss initially can certainly help bring blood pressure down and means that we don't need to go to medication as a first line therapy. It's another condition that we will do a separate video on and that's sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, whereby we don't have refreshed sleep at night and there might be symptoms of snoring or just feeling tired during the course of the day. Well, that in itself can also cause our blood pressure to be elevated. So that's also another key factor to talk with your general practitioner about if you have relevant symptoms. But unfortunately when blood pressure continues to be elevated then there are medications that need to be considered because we know the long-term consequences of high blood pressure. Uh, well look, there, there are several uh, issues that can transpire as a result of high blood pressure and you can imagine if the pressure is consistently high which means that the heart's having to pump a higher blood pressure then the heart muscle can get a little bit tired. The muscle typically gets what we call hypertrophied or thickened or enlarged. And that can then lead to other conditions such as fluid buildup, puffiness in the ankles, shortness of breath and so forth. So it's important that we try to control blood pressure as best as possible to minimize, to minimize the consequences on, say for example, the heart or the kidneys. So we would normally work on a low dose of a medication and build it up if needed to get on top of blood pressure control. And as it most often with one medication or often a combination uh, formulation which has two or three preparations in the one pill can actually be very very useful at reducing blood pressure. 
but it does not mean that we don't address the lifestyle factors because again it's a partnership working together with a patient we combine therapies such as the medications but also with ongoing lifestyle measures to address high blood pressure Now, what are the risks of having a high blood pressure? Well, you can imagine with the heart muscle beating with, up against a higher blood pressure, the heart muscle itself can actually thicken or hypertrophy. So if you go to the gym and you do bicep curls, well then your bicep muscles will enlarge. And that's, some people might say that's a great thing, having biceps. The heart, however, working under stress, equally will enlarge and will hypertrophy. But hypertrophy in the heart is not often a good thing. And hypertrophy can lead to complications long term. It puts more stress in the heart. It may predispose you to building up more fluid in the body, more fluid in the ankles, more fluid in the lungs. So it's important that we try to minimize the risks of blood pressure long term to keep us well and to keep our heart health optimal. Now, what are some of the tests that you might be asked to do when, you, when you've been evaluated for high blood pressure? Well, one of the more common tests is to look at an electrocardiogram. And that's a simple tracing of the heart done from leads on the outside. And that gives us an indication about how the heart is functioning, but also gives us an idea of how thick the heart might be or how thick the muscle is or how hypertrophied the muscle is, which may give us an indication of how long standing the high blood pressure is. If we do see signs of that, then we're more likely to go in and start therapy sooner rather than waiting longer. An echocardiogram or an ultrasound of the heart can be useful to get an accurate assessment of how the heart's contracting, or systole, but also how the heart is relaxing, diastole. And that gives us an impression of what the pressures are inside the heart, and that again tells us the likely chronicity of the problem and what are the best forms of therapies that we can target to bring your blood pressure down and relieve any symptoms you may have. So I hope you got something out of this. As I said, it was essentially a one-on-one -on -one overview of blood pressure, what it is, how we measure it, and the importance of optimizing lifestyle therapies rather than jumping into medication initially but again the importance of medication which have no doubt shown a prognostic benefit in reducing the chances of complications building up in the future such as stroke such as heart attack kidney problems so again and it's also about monitoring blood pressure in the context of your other risk factors that you might have there might be high cholesterol diabetes, smoking, obesity. These are also of paramount importance. So we don't only focus on one individual cardiac risk factor in isolation, but we look at with a broad uh, overview to look at optimizing blood pressure, but also optimizing and reducing your chances of having any complications in the future. See you again soon.